All right, so up next is Marcus, who will be speaking on the topic of monads are not burritos. Who originally called monad a burrito? Does anyone know that? <laughs> and an elephant and like lots of other metaphors. So tonight, if you don't know what a monad is, hopefully you'll, you'll find out that at the very least, it's not a burrito. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, my name is Marcus Greet. I work for a company called Simpress out on the East Coast, just outside of Boston. If any of you have ordered business cards from a company called Vistaprint, you've probably ordered business cards from my company. Uh, and about a year ago, I began uh, delving into functional programming languages with my squad, and uh, we got introduced to a whole bunch of concepts, including the M word. Uh, I know that we're really close to being able to get to food trucks, and I'm talking about burritos, so I'll try and speed up. <laughs> but one of the things, I was out kind of in the front and learning a lot of things, and, and so I was doing a lot of pet projects, and I wanted to show my coworkers, hey, take a look at this cool thing that I'm doing, right? And they were like, okay, I'm actually interested. So they come on over, and I'm like, okay, the challenger appears. Okay, so I'm talking to my friend, and I'm telling them, I'm selling them hard on, on immutability, uh, on the freedom from side effects that, that functional programming languages provide. I show them a 1,000 line diff where I changed a whole bunch of things, refactored an entire module, and everything just worked because the type checker was able to take care of those things, dynamic languages aside. So I show off this pet project and show them around all of the things that are amazing within all of our functional programming ecosystems. And I'm like, you know, this is amazing, you should get into this too. And then they notice something. They're like, yeah, but what, what does that do? I mean, literally, what, is, what are these things? In fact, you probably didn't see these because we have lots of syntactic sugar in our languages. So they probably saw do, or they saw maybe and let, or they saw do monad. And they're like, what, what is that? So here, okay. I'm a new functional programmer. I'm getting another new functional programmer. So what does that do? Oh, that's the maybe monad. It's probably not the best first answer. Because then they come back with, so what exactly is a monad? <laughs> we start going off and we start st saying things like, oh, well, it's a container. It's a wrapper for something. Or it's a burrito, right? We go into those type of analogies. But once we start going down this road, we've kind of heavily boxed in this monad, and we haven't really described the thing that it actually does or what benefit it provides to us. Uh, we might try and bring them back and try and say, hey, you know, actually, let's talk about category theory. It's like, you might even throw onto the fire. It's a, uh, it's a monoid. Uh, let's see, what was it? What is it? A, a monoid in the category of endofunctors, right? <laughs> Might as well just throw that under the fire. You're already going down the burrito route. Probably not the best choice. You kind of lost them. Okay, so let's go back in time. Let's reevaluate and say, okay, what if we could have another choice? What if we could say something like, well, it chains together two functions that may or may not produce a value, right? So let's choose that answer. So once we go down this route, now we can pull up things like, uh, at least in F-sharp, we have F-sharp for fun and profit, and we have this wonderful railroad analogy here. And we can pull up and we can say, we've got these two functions, right? Both of them might produce a value, they might not. And we want to be able to chain those two things together. Right? So we need some sort of glue, we need something that makes it so that, well, if, if we get a none, or if we get nothing out of this function, we don't really have a meaningful value to plug into the next function, so we just want to bypass it. And if we get just, or if we get some value, then we want to go ahead and take that value and pass it into the next function. In effect, we want to turn this into this. All right. So now I've reframed the discussion. I haven't even said the word monad. I'm talking about that particular concrete instance and that particular implementation and what that does for me in this instance. In Elm, they have uh, monadic binds and they have applicative, but they don't end up using the same terms that we use in a lot of other functional programming languages. In fact, they've explicitly eschewed these things. Instead, they use and then for bind, and they use and map for apply. 
Elm is designed and, and oriented towards JavaScript developers who have been living in a highly imperative world who are just stepping into a functional language. And so this is kind of that hand out to help them put, come in. And yes, if you look in their documentation, down at the very last line of some of these functions, you'll say, oh, and for more experienced functional programmers, you'll recognize this as apply or as the applicative. So what you want to do is you want to aim for concrete examples. You want to point out, oh, this is a reader. It's chaining an argument or an environment through a computa computation to produce a value. Or state mimics mutation by threading state through a computation to produce a value. IO chains together the intent to perform certain effects as part of a computation, delaying those effects until they're later executed. As you point out more of these concrete actual implementations of the monad pattern, a pattern starts to emerge. And that's where you can start to discuss, well, the monad is actually that pattern, right? It's how we chain these things together. So for me, I have my own little definition of a monad when I get to that point, and somebody has kind of gotten to where they understand these various different instances of the monads. And I'll say, a monad is a structure that defines how to chain its operations together so those operations compose sanely. I haven't gone into the mathematical laws. There are plenty of mathematical laws there. But it's about compo comp sane composition, right? So humans are a lot better at understanding concepts when you start concrete, and then they can help to work to generalize over a pattern to get to something abstract. So when you start off, don't start with, oh, that's a monad. Focus on explaining concrete examples. Go through, probably the very first one that you're gonna run into is going to be something like maybe, or list, especially if you're talking to people who are coming from C-sharp and they've been using link all of the time. There's, there's your, there's your uh, monad kind of right there in, in select many and all of those types of things. As the pattern emerges, then you can give it that name and let them know that this is that weird thing that seemed so high up in the clouds, but now you can see the pattern and now it makes sense to you. And remember, you didn't start off by explaining lists to anybody else by saying, oh, that's the list monad, right? So thank you. <laughs>